Good morning. morning. Welcome you to worship this morning as we celebrate the fifth Sunday of Easter. And today we take the opportunity to focus on our uh, stewardship uh, plan that we've been focusing all year, the God Live Life. Today we start our third quarter, and today we are going to see that a God Live Life is a life lived shrewdly. And so our order of worship will be a little bit different than it normally is. Um, We've got a lesson uh, that we're not going to be using. We're singing one less hymn because we're going to have that Bible study portion uh, at the end of the service. So that's the part where I ask questions and then you answer them. So congregational participation is always appreciated at that point. You can see the order of service printed in our service folder. It's also on the screen. We're going to begin this morning with our gathering right. And just one note there as well. Um, If you're going to follow along in the hymnal, Uh, With that opening hymn, uh, we're going to sing the refrain after each stanza. There's some notes in there. For example, uh, if we would just sing it regularly, you'd go straight from stanza one to stanza two, and then the refrain. We're going to sing the refrain each time through. We begin our worship in the same way we were baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, Every good and perfect gift comes from you, including the physical gifts you pour out into our lives. You intend these treasures to be used for your glory and in service to our neighbors. We repent for being selfish in the use of the treasures you have given. Forgive us and let your peace rule our lives. Dear Savior Jesus, though you were rich, yet for our sakes you became poor, so that through your poverty we might become rich. All too often we have been rich toward ourselves, instead of rich towards you, out of thanks for our forgiveness won for us by your cross and empty tomb. Forgive us and let your love fill our lives. O Holy Spirit, you have worked faith in our hearts, and you cause us to produce good fruit. We are sorry that our financial stewardship often fails to qualify as good fruit motivated by your love. Forgive us and live within us.
as a called servant of the triune God, I announce to you his grace and forgiveness. On behalf of and by the command of our Savior Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We pray. Almighty God, you have brought us into the body of Christ by your grace and mercy. Help us to imitate the example of your Son and of our brothers and sisters who have gone before in humble and willing service to you, full of faith, hope, and love. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our first reading this morning is taken from the Old Testament book of 2 Kings, the fourth chapter, where we see a godly woman using her resources for what really matters. She wasn't giving in order to receive or to get. She was giving to support the ministry of the gospel. One day, Elisha went to Shunem. A wealthy woman lived there, and she urged him to eat a meal with her. So whenever he passed by, he would stop there for a meal. Then she said to her husband, Listen, I know that the man who passes by here all the time is a holy man of God. Let's make a small upper room on the roof, and let's put a bed, a table, a chair, and a lamp there for him. Then whenever he comes to us, he can stay there. One day when Elisha came there, he went into the room and lay down. Then he said to Gehazi, his servant, Call the woman of Shunem. He called her, and she stood in front of him. Then Elisha said to Gehazi, Tell her, you have been very concerned about us. What can we do for you? Is there something we can request for you from the king or from the commander of the army? She said, I am living among my own people. Then he said, What can be done for her? And Gehazi said, Well, she has no son, and her husband is old. He said, Call her. So he called her, and she stood at the doorway. Then he said to her, At this time next year, you will be holding a son. But she said, No, my Lord, you man of God, do not deceive your servant. But the woman conceived, and she gave birth to a son at that same time of year, just as Elisha said to her. The word of the Lord. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. Our gospel is found in Luke chapter 16, beginning at verse 1. Jesus also said to his disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager who was accused of wasting his possessions. The rich man called him in and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you can no longer be manager. The manager said to himself, What will I do since my master is taking away the management position from me? I am not strong enough to dig. I am ashamed to beg. I know what I will do so that when I am removed from my position as manager, people will receive me into their houses. He called each one of his master's debtors to him. He asked the first, How much do you owe my master? He said, Six hundred gallons of olive oil. 
He said to him, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and write 300. Then he said to another, How much do you owe? And he said, 600 bushels of wheat. He said to him, Take your bill and write 480. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the children of light are. I tell you, make friends for yourselves with unrighteous mammon, so that when it runs out, they will welcome you into e the eternal dwellings. The person who is faithful with very little is also faithful with much. And the person who is unrighteous with very little is also unrighteous with much. So if you have not been faithful with unrighteous mammon, who will entrust you with what is really valuable? If you have not been faithful with what belongs to someone else, who will give you something to be your own? No servant can serve two masters. Indeed, either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. The Pharisees, who loved money, also heard all these things and sneered at him. He said to them, You are the ones who justify yourselves in the sight of people, but God knows your hearts. In fact, what is highly regarded among people is an abomination in God's sight. The Gospel of the Lord. Be to you, Lord Congregation may be seated as we sing our hymn of the day, hymn 752, Gracious God, You Send Great Blessings.
Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. A portion of God's word for our consideration this morning is found in our Gospel, Luke chapter 16. Let's begin with prayer. O Lord, open my lips that my mouth may declare your praise. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts, may they be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. We've reached the third quarter of our stewardship challenge, the God-lived life. And as we've said before, normally when you hear that word stewardship, you think about money. And yes, money is a part of stewardship. It's something that God has given to us, something he wants us to manage and to use wisely. But so far, we haven't really touched on money. Today, as we explore the God-lived life as a life lived truly, we'll touch on money a bit. But really, even as we talk about money, it's the attitude about money more than the money itself that we're concerned with. To think about this, I want you to think about the question asked by the scoundrel in Jesus' story. And maybe you think that's too strong of a word for this guy, but if you really think about it, this guy is a self-centered narcissist who is dishonest and unjust. And when you think about him that way, it doesn't really make us want to listen to what he has to say. But here's the thing. In this story, Jesus is taking us from the known to the unknown, and he introduces us to a character that we can relate to. Mr. Selfish. And I think you know why and how we can relate to him. Too often we are him. Too often we make decisions based on three factors. Me, myself, and I. So let's set the stage Jesus tells this story not to make us want to be like this guy completely, but to point out one particular characteristic. Jesus is not asking us to emulate his selfishness or his dishonesty or his stealing. The one thing that Jesus points to as worthwhile, the one thing that Jesus wants to demonstrate in this story is he was shrewd. That's the thing that Jesus was illustrating. He was shrewd. He was prudent. He thought through the situation. He thought about his goal. And then he used what he had to reach that goal. Let's read the story again. Jesus also said to his disciples, and notice he's talking to his disciples here, so that means that he's talking to us. There's something for us here to learn. There was a rich man who had a manager who was accused of wasting his possessions. The rich man called him in and said to him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you can no longer be manager. The man had been given responsibilities. The job of a household manager, often translated as a steward, was an important one. He had full control over his master's possessions. All of his stuff, his business dealings, his resources, and his job was to use all of those things for the master's benefit. Well, apparently he had not been doing that very well. He had done something wrong, and now he's getting fired. Keep in mind that this word steward or manager is one often used to describe us as believers. Everything belongs to God. We are simply stewards of it or managers of it. And knowing what God says about how we're supposed to use his stuff, I think there are more than a few of us who should be right there with this guy getting fired. But here's the thing. This is where we see the guy's shrewdness. He thinks through the situation. The manager said to himself, what will I do? And there's our question 
for today. What will I do since my master is taking away the management position from me? I am not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. His options for caring for himself aren't good. But then it strikes him. The steward's great insight is that he realizes that the solution has to come from outside of himself. He doesn't have the resources in himself, but for just a little bit yet, he has full control of his master's stuff. Until he hands over the books, he's got something. And think about how that applies to the stuff that we have here in this life. Until life is done. It's just a short bit of time. And so the master says, I know what I will do so that when I am removed from my position as manager, people will receive me into their houses. He called each one of his master's debtors to him. He asked the first, how much do you owe my master? He said, 600 gallons of olive oil. He said to him, take your bill, sit down quickly and write 300. These are huge numbers. We're, we're likely talking about long-term renters of the land, people who were almost, in a sense, business partners with this wealthy master. Then he says to another, How much do you owe? He said, 600 bushels of wheat. He said to him, Take your bill and write 480. So this unjust steward uses the authority he had over his master's stuff with a goal in mind. And obviously the master has many reasons to be upset with what this guy is doing here. This guy who had failed to manage his possessions properly in the past is now giving away his money. But he was also doing something else. He was counting on what he knew of his master. He knew his master was at heart merciful. Otherwise, he wouldn't have even imagined trying to get away with this. The only way that this works is if the master goes along with it and does this nice thing for these people. And the master realized this, and he commended the unjust manager for it. Do you notice why? It wasn't for being unjust. Listen to verse 8. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. And this is the point of Jesus' story. Acting shrewdly. Using what we have for a specific purpose. Jesus goes on. <coughs> Excuse me. For the children of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the children of light are. The lesson we learn here today is to be more shrewd with the things we've been given, but with a much different purpose. And that becomes clear as Jesus applies this story in verse 9. I tell you, make friends for yourselves with unrighteous mammon, so that when it runs out, they will welcome you into eternal dwellings. We have an eternal purpose that is far greater than anything in this short life. And yet what we do in this short life still matters. The person who is faithful with very little is also faithful with much, and the person who is unrighteous with very little is also unrighteous with much. So if you have not been faithful with unrighteous mammon, who will entrust you with what is really valuable? If you have not been faithful with what belongs to someone else, who will give you something to be your own? No servant can serve two masters. Indeed, either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. There is only one number one. It's been said that God will put up with a lot of things, but second place isn't one of them. The Pharisees who, also, who loved money also heard all these things and sneered at him. 
He said to them, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the sight of people, but God knows your hearts. In fact, what is highly regarded among people is an abomination in God's sight. There's a lot in here. But we want to focus on the main point. Jesus isn't defending the man in the story for what he did. He is commending him for how he used the stuff that he had for the time that he had it. His goal was wrong, his own self-preservation. He wanted to find a way to serve himself, and yet Jesus makes it clear that we have a better goal. We have true riches. We have what is valued by God instead of what is valued in men's eyes. And so he says, be all the more shrewd with it. Jesus tells us to use our money, our resources for what really matters. And Jesus is the perfect example of that. While this parable focuses on money, Jesus showed it in every aspect. He came to earth for a limited time, somewhere around 33 years. And he had that limited time to work like every other human being. And notice how he used that time. Already as a 12-year-old in the temple, he's using his time to live as a disciple, growing in the word. And then again and again, we see him prioritizing time for prayer, committed to growing his relationship with his father. We see him prioritizing souls as he had compassion on those who were like sheep without a shepherd so that he gave them time even when it wasn't convenient for him. Through it all, we see Jesus prioritizing our eternity. He was committed to going up to Jerusalem to be betrayed and beaten, to suffer and die for us. For all the times that we put this now life over our new life, he gave his life. He put us first. He remembered our eternity when all that we could think about was how to enjoy our best life now. He literally saves us from ourselves. And that changes the way that we look at things. That gives us a new life, a life forever in heaven, yes, but a new kind of life right now, one that is a God-lived life. And as his disciples, it's a life of service, a life that is shrewd, that uses what we've been given in order to live that new life, to show that that new life is as important as it really is. And so what does that look like for you? You all should have received one of these in your bulletin this morning. There's some great ideas on there, ways that you can be more shrewd with what you have, things like prioritizing God's work and personal budgets. That's remembering what Jesus says about a mindset that focuses on eternity instead of focusing so much on the now. And remember, it's always been his stuff. We can trust that he is a merciful master who will give us all that we need. Take a look at what you have and assess your offerings to God. From what he's provided, according to your means, find the offering that tells him, Lord, I challenge myself to trust you even more because I know your mercies are so great. Many people like to try for 10%. Challenge yourselves. Because what is most important is going to come first. What will I do? The choice is yours. May God strengthen you to live a God-lived life. A life lived shrewdly. God grant it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Please stand. Now may that peace of God which surpasses our understanding may keep you in your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.
We join in confessing our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Congregation may be seated as we gather the offering. We'll continue with the prayer of the church in our uh, special prayers this morning. We uh, ask for God's blessing and those who recently have graduated from college, uh, specifically Martin Luther College this weekend. We have uh, two of our members who graduated and one who uh, received a call. Uh, Kelsey Birschbach uh, received a call to Rhinelander, Wisconsin. So as her parents move to Florida, she goes as far north as she possibly can in Wisconsin. So there's a little bit of irony there. So we pray. Almighty Father, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. You give us time, energy, talents, and treasures. Because of you, we can say with the psalmist, the boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Your word teaches us of your great love for us and how to love our neighbor. Give us wisdom in using your gifts in God-pleasing ways. Lord, in your mercy. Lord Jesus Christ, you tell us that what people value highly is detestable in God's sight. Help us to recognize our true treasure in you, our Savior and our God. Protect us from the devil who would have us marvel at insignificant things as a treasure while neglecting the great gifts you give us in your word and sacraments. Give us wisdom in cherishing you and your greater gifts in God-pleasing ways. Lord, in your mercy... Holy Spirit, you have set us apart and made our bodies your temple. You live in us. Your word teaches us who we really are by the grace of God 
and through the innocent suffering and death of our Lord Jesus Christ. Give us wisdom to see that godliness with contentment is great gain, and grow in us the fruit that is pleasing to you. Lord, in your mercy. O Holy Spirit, sent by Jesus to guide us into all truth, shower your gifts and graces on all graduates. Enable them to use the lessons they have learned to advance their own welfare, to serve others, and become ambassadors for Christ. As they step into an uncertain future, strengthen them with your word and sacrament so that they may be comforted with your saving presence. Remind them daily of their baptisms so that they never forget that they have received an inheritance that will never fade. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Accept our prayers for the sake of, our, sake of Jesus, our Savior. Help us not to be arrogant, nor to put our hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but help us to put our hope in you, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. For Jesus, our Savior's sake, amen. And we join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. At this time, we'll turn to uh, page 9 in the bulletin, or you can also follow along uh, with the screen for our Bible study uh, a God-lived life, a life lived shrewdly. The portion of our study from God's Word is focused on 1 Timothy chapter 6. We'll read those verses right now. But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world, and we certainly cannot take anything out. But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be satisfied. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap, and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge them into complete destruction and utter ruin. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evils. By striving for money, some have wandered away from the faith and have pierced themselves with many pains. But you, O oh man of God, flee from these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of eternal life to which you were called and about which you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus, who made a good confession as a witness before Pontius Pilate, that you keep this command without spot and without fault <clears throat> until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will make known at the proper time, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who lives in unapproachable light, and whom no one has seen or is able to see. To him be honor and power forever. Amen. Instruct those who are rich in this present age not to be arrogant or to put their hope in the uncertainty of riches, but rather in God, who richly supplies us with all things for our enjoyment. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they are storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul says that godliness with contentment is great gain. The writer of Proverbs 30, verses 8 and 9 prays, Keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, Who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal, and so dishonor the name of my God. How is this a great example of godliness with contentment? And how does it serve as a test to see if we have godliness with contentment? So here's the part where you get to participate. So feel free to talk to your neighbor. We'll give you just about 30 seconds to think about that, and then we'll try and answer that. <clears throat> Specifically, it's focusing on the Proverbs verses there.
Okay? How does that serve as a great example of godliness with contentment? That's just the part where you raise your hands and I call on you. Because I'm not just going to call on somebody without them raising their hand unless they're my children or they're in my catechism classes. So there's both of those examples here. So don't make me call on my children. They're putting me to the test, children. Tim, thank you. Yeah, and, and money is a, a part of what we, it's a part of our fabric of society, and we'll, get, we'll talk about this a little bit more on uh, the next question, but it's, it's part of what we do. And so what is specifically the good example here that he's showing? What is he asking for? Yeah, he's asking for only what he needs. He doesn't want too much because the temptation then is if he has too much, he says, well, who's God? I don't need God. I've got everything and more, right? And he doesn't want too little because of the temptation then to, to steal, right? And so it's a great example of that because he's asking for just enough, just enough for what he needs, and how does this serve as a test to have godliness with contentment? Just ask yourselves the question. Think about this. This is, I think, profound. Have you ever prayed for less, for God to give you less than what you have? Have you ever prayed for God to give you less than what you have? It's an interesting, interesting thought. Let's go into the text. Verse 10. One of the most misquoted verses in the Bible. Many have misquoted it by saying, money is the root of all kinds of evil instead of the love of money. Prove that money is not evil. So Tim already proved that for us. He wanted to jump right in, right? We use money at Eastside. Therefore, it's not evil, right? We have to use money. That's the way our society is structured, right? <clears throat> Years ago, pastors got paid with livestock, right? You got a chicken, that was your salary. That's how you fed your family, right? Because that's what the farmers had. That was the currency, right? That's not that way anymore. What are some other ways that we can prove that money is not evil? Jonathan. They used a lot of money to build the temple. Yeah, think of all of the biblical characters, for lack of a better term, biblical people that were wealthy, almost beyond imagination. Abraham, Job, David, Solomon. Wealth is not evil. Chuck? We use money, for, um, for <clears throat> we use money to spread the gospel, right? That's how we support mission work around the world. We use money to support the government. Right, which God calls us to do. We use money to support our own families. So money itself is not evil. The problem with money is not the money itself, but it's the attitude toward money. What was the difference between, <clears throat> say, someone like Abraham and someone like Judas? Judas was greedy, right? That's why he sold Jesus uh, to the Pharisees, because he was greedy for money. Think of the parable of the rich uh, fool, or the rich man and poor Lazarus, whether that's a parable or not, it's a different question, but he lived for this life and not for the, the new life, right? Think of the rich young man who came to Jesus, wanted to follow him, and Jesus said, give up all your stuff. And he couldn't do it because that's what was most important to him. Number two, in verse 11, Paul tells Timothy to flee from all this. He's talking about all these things, the love of money specifically. Um, <clears throat> And you'll notice that in the, uh, the EHV, it uses the term mammon instead of money. 
Uh, mammon's not a, a, a word that we use uh, most often. Money would have been, I think, in the NIV translation. Um, but I, in, in my opinion, money is just a little bit too narrow of a term, which I think is why they went back to mammon, which includes more than just money. There's, there's possessions there too. But <clears throat> Paul tells Timothy to flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. How does each help a person flee from all this and inquire and acquire contentment. So think about, let's take them one by one. How does pursuing righteousness help us to acquire contentment? Where is righteousness found? In the Word, word, right? It's not found in ourselves, it's found in Christ, right? We talk about Christ's righteousness being given to us, right? Right? Being clothed in Christ's righteousness when we're baptized we're wrapped in the robe of Christ's righteousness right so that's found outside of ourselves how about godliness can I produce my own godliness not apart from Christ right again found outside of myself what about faith faith is a gift again from outside of myself you're seeing a pattern here All of these things come from outside of ourselves. We gain contentment. We're reminded of God's love when we seek those things that he gives, not things that we produce ourselves. Number three, in verses 13 and following, Paul alludes to Jesus' second coming. In what ways is this motivation to flee from all this? Yeah, I'm guessing that some of you have seen the bumper sticker, He Who Dies With The Most Toys Wins. Ever seen that bumper sticker? Maybe you haven't. Maybe it's just me. I thought it was kind of ironic, though, right? Because it's not anywhere close to true, right? You can't take any of it with you, right? And Jesus tells us that we're going to have to give an account of how we've managed his stuff. And so... If we have to give an account and we know he's coming again, we want to make sure that that account is going to be a positive one. So that helps us to flee from all of these things. Number four, in verses 17 through 19, Paul lists two dangers when God blesses someone with wealth and then describes the best ways to use your wealth. Identify the two dangers and how one should use their wealth. So what are the two dangers? The Thursday night crowd got both of them. So... I'm hoping we can do the same. I didn't have to give them the answers. They got both of them. Two dangers that are listed in verses 17 through 19. Chuck? Self-reliance. Yes. You think that it's because of you. So self-reliance or arrogance, right? All this wealth is because of what I've done. So that's one danger. And the second one is Ted. Storing up, wealth. Storing up wealth. You put your trust in the money rather than in God. Yeah. So when God blesses us with wealth, there's two dangers there. We can become arrogant and think that this is all because of who we are. God has blessed me so richly because I'm so good. Or we can become dependent on that. What is the proper way to use wealth? According to these verses. Generosity. Generosity. Yeah. To share it. Generosity. To share it. All right. Let's apply this now. For what reasons can a person who loves money not be content? Thank you. Yeah, you, you never have enough. When you, when you love money, you never have enough. You're always seeking more. And really, it becomes an idol then. And idols are insatiable. Which is why Jesus says you can't serve two masters. 
mentioned it in the sermon, but that quote, I think, I'm not sure which uh, seminary professor said it, but um, God will put up with a lot of things, but second place isn't one of them. Um, there's so much truth in that. Number two, Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. Uh, he's being quoted there in Acts 20. Uh, Jesus said, long ascended into heaven by that time, um, but he's being quoted there. Explain the truth of Jesus' words when it comes to our spending priorities, like gifts to the Lord, paying taxes, providing for family and the poor. And Okay. It's all God's to begin with, right? So when we're giving, it's always a small act of trust, right? There's always a small act of trust there that when we're giving because we're saying, I don't need this, and I'm trusting that God's going to still provide for me, right? If you receive an anonymous gift, what is the, the natural reaction that you have when you receive an anonymous gift? You're happy, okay. What else? What's that? I heard it over here. Who? Yeah, who gave it to me? Why do you want to know? So you can say thank you, right? That's our natural response. When someone gives us a gift, we want to say thank you. It's more blessed to give than to receive. Look at what God has given to us, right? We want to say thank you, and one way that we can say thank you is by prioritizing his work, <clears throat> by, doing our, by taking care of our responsibilities. Supporting the function of society is a way to say thank you to God. Paying your taxes, I don't like taxes any more than the next person, don't get me wrong, right? But paying your taxes is a way of saying thank you to God for how he's blessed us, because we're supporting the government that he's put in place. And the last one, Martin Luther said that money must be the least of all of God's gifts because he even gives it to fools. What truth was Luther trying to make about money and its place? Mr. Doof, are you raising your hand? Okay. Um, I'll say everybody gets it, but I'm putting it out of medical, not glorifying it. Okay, good. <clears throat> and I think the other thing, too, is that there's so many more valuable gifts than money uh, that we have been given. Um, our faith, <laughs> the vocation that God has placed us in, the opportunity to serve Him. And, and I think His point is. Instead of focusing so much on money, focus on those things. All right. I would encourage you to uh, take a look at those challenge cards. <clears throat> we gave you four different choices of uh, things that we thought would be good uh, ways to live shrewdly. Um, notice there's a blank spot there, too, where you can add your own. If you have something else specifically in mind that you would like to challenge yourselves over this next quarter, um, go ahead and do that. And again, this is between you and this is between you and God. This is not something that um, we're looking to look at and, and, and <clears throat> evaluate or judge or anything like that. If you would like to share them with us so that we can use uh, the choices that people have made uh, anonymously to uh, encourage others, we're happy to take them and use those. Uh, maybe you can put it up on your fridge or at the, uh, have it to the mirror so you see it regularly, put it in front of you that way. Um, and again, when it comes to stewardship, this is always uh, <clears throat> something that's between you and your Savior, right? Based on what you've been given. Uh, I told this story on Thursday night, but um, when uh, I was at my previous congregation, we were blessed to be able to build a brand new building, 10,000 square foot building. It was about a million dollar project, and we had less than 200 people in our congregation. So it was a pretty big underdoing. Uh, God tr tremendously blessed uh, some of those people with financial resources to do that, right? <clears throat> well, the people in town could not figure out how in the world 
that small group of people was putting up that kind of building. And so, of course, rumors started flying, right? So I had one of my members tell me that they had someone talk to them. I don't think they realized that they were a member and said that we were requiring, in order to be a member at that church, <clears throat> that they had to give us $5,000 up front. And then 10% of their income was their dues, it was required. Which, of course, is ridiculous because we've never said anything like that. We never tell people what to give. We offer biblical precedent and uh, suggestions, but we never tell people what to give. And so I, I told that member, I said, well, you should have told them it was 10 grand and 20%. <laughs> so you're, 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 we're, you're never going to hear that from us. This is between you and your Savior, uh, what God has uh, blessed you to be able to give based on how he's blessed you. Um, so please take... Keep that in mind. Take that to heart. Thank you for your uh, participation uh, this morning. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We'll conclude by singing hymn 748, Brothers, Sisters, Let Us Gladly. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to all of you.